Every Nigerian must be instrumental to the growth and development of our nation through the use of innovative energy and idea to lead and initiate policies that will sustain the economy and enhance good governance. With all the financial turmoil facing the world, it has become pertinent for exchange of new ideas that will enhance good governance. Please subscribe to our channels, listen to our messages and engage with us. With your support, we can transform the lives of all Nigerians. Welcome to the Season 2 of the NESG Radio. Welcome to NESG Radio. My name is Oluwashe Vincent. I am your host for today. So today we'll be delving into impact investing in Nigeria, discussing some of the findings from an NESG report on the subject. So I'm so, so pleased to have my colleagues with me today. We have Mr. Shakuruddin Taiwo, Mr. Sodik Olofe, and Mr. Wasu Adikle. Hi, guys. Hi, she. Thank you for having us on this podcast. Okay, welcome. So let's just delve into the issue. So we're going to be looking into impact investing in Nigeria, how we can unlock investment for impact um, within the country. So I'll start with you, Shakiruddin. So the Nigerian National Advisory Board for Impact Investing, NABI, is collaborating with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group on the project Investing for Impact in Nigeria, Deep Dive into Agriculture, Education and Health Sectors. What motivated this project and the choice of sectors? Oh, um, um, thank you very much once again for the opportunity to actually discuss um, the details from um, the report um, as commissioned by the GSG, which translates to Global Impact Investing um, Group and also the IDRC, the International Development Research Corporation. So the research uh, was actually conducted in partnership with the NABI, which actually means the Nigerian National Advisory Board for Impact Investing and the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. We, we all understand that in recent time, they are large focused on the performance of Nigerian um, macroeconomic business and investment environment. Aside from the size of the, uh, the economy of Nigeria, which is um, the biggest size uh, in Africa, we also host a lot of potential as a country. However, over the years, these investment opportunities that Nigeria have attracted, with a lot of um, investment in many of our tech startups, evolving into unicorns in recent time, we have had three. These has translated into lead to social outcomes. So this prompted the question, what are the benefits of this investment? Are these investments being direct into the most appropriate in terms of generating social um, um, outcomes, in terms of job creation, elevating poverty, improving um, the economic growth. So these are a lot of questions that this research seeks to answer and considering the, the macroeconomic um, uh, performance of the country. So I think this is the basic thinking of both the funder the National Advisory Board, the NABI, and the NESG. And coincidentally, the focus of this research being the agriculture, education, and health also aligned with the five critical sectors that the NESG actually identified in their 2020 macroeconomic report for being sectors that can enhance achievement of inclusive economic growth in Nigeria. So it is more like this research um, is building on the previous work that NESG has done, is looking at answering that question around unlocking inclusive development in Nigeria, and also answering the question of the global environment on why investment in recent time has not generated the necessary or expected social uh, outcomes. 
So the market has seen rising interest from non-GFI investors. So that's one of the features that we see in recent times. So what are some of the other key features of, of Nigeria's growing impact investment market that you can highlight? Okay, so just like you have mentioned that the market is probably the, the, the largest in the West African region. However, so when we compare with other economies such as Egypt and South Africa, the, the growth being experienced in the Nigerian impact investing market is actually um, lower than these um, country peers as far as the continent is concerned. However, between 2015 and 2022, so you know, we are already in 2023, so there are some of the key futures of the of the market as far as it is evolving it is nascent it's just growing uh, uh, there are a lot of traction first is that it is dominated by the foreign dfis a lot of impact investment in recent time are made the commitment the flow of funds are made by non um local DFIs, such as the MasterCard, the Rockefeller Foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates. So this is one of the future of the market. So it's more like the, the local acceptance at the moment is still minimal compared to the foreign um, development partners that have actually had grip of understanding the market and how they could make a lot of impact. So the second is that the market is at the moment dominated by grants as uh, an impact investing instrument. So we could see there are a lot of activities from foundations such as uh, Tony Illumilu Foundation, you know, providing business grants, incubation, more like for enterprise to grow. And we also, on the other side, we we'll, we'll see uh, limited participation from government DFIs. You know, we have um, um, institutions such as the Bank of Industry, um, 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 Development Bank of Nigeria, whose activities can be categorized within this space. But the, 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 their participation is a little bit more like um, limited when you compare with uh, the, the peers globally on, on this market. And also is that there's a lot of like more unique characteristics of the Nigerian impact investing space in terms of when you look at the stakeholder composition. Nigeria has um, uniquely a uh, stakeholder called the intermediaries that sort of ensure fusions of activities of the, the, the credit suppliers and the firms or the enterprise that would need this type of credit. So you have players in this space, such as the CC Hub, you have players um, um, uh, such as um, uh, the Faith Foundation. So these are players within this space. It's more like not what you likely see in the in, in the advanced or more the emerging market around and around this space having some intermediaries that would ensure a, a development of enterprise that meets the demand of the the fund providers we also understand that at this moment we are having the development of socially different enterprise coming into this space as well um, that are providing more um, mixture of profit oriented and social impact, so we'll see the effects, uh, commodity exchange on, on this, on this, um, on this um, stake, stakeholder list around this social enterprise. We could see the Baba Ghana, we could see tomato just around this space. So you could see a lot, and also, largely, we the impact investing market is also then um, having a transformation or a metamorphosis of ensuring that. The corporate social responsibilities of profit-making companies in Nigeria are also being uh, directed into ensuring there is impact. So you have this a lot of this uniqueness around this space. So just like I've mentioned, the dominance of foreign um, non-DFIs in this space, um, the, the 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 limited participation of the public DFIs in Nigeria. We have talked about the the role, the unique role of some intermediaries in on the market and we have talked about the current uh, uh, transition of major corporate social responsibility into this space and also largely and the dominance of grants as we have mentioned and in recent time we are we are seeing a mixture of um, um grants and equity investments with maybe such programs such as the orange corner with the faith foundation so you are seeing this evolution of um 
of, of futures and emerging attributes. So, and just like I've mentioned previously that the market is still nascent, it's still growing. We hope that in recent time, we will see more catalytic funding coming in terms of government providing that uptake um, financing for enterprise that will generate a lot of social social uh, uh, outcomes for the people. We maybe we would also look at the development of more socially driven enterprise. Just uh, like the one we have mentioned, we need a lot of them in this market uh, at the moment. But those are the, just the basic characteristics of the market um, as uh, we we are able to 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 find from the from the research. Great, fantastic, very, very robust answer. So one other thing that I thought maybe you might be able to touch on. So I think um, evidence also suggests that many impact investors are not located within Nigeria. Can you just speak to that? So why do you think we have this sort of trend and is that something that's being reversed? Okay, maybe that might take us to, to the some of the policy recommendations because what we did and this research is also to look at what has been working, what has made the market's growth to be limited with what we have detected. So we understand that at the moment in Nigeria, the policy environment is more like suited for the conventional investment, not totally fitted for impact investing products. So these are the questions around regulations. These are the questions around um, laws that provide that incentives or market guideline for impact um, operations. So we we'll, would we'll see this, and for major um, emerging countries that have attracted major impact investment in the design time is that they, they are like intention, intentional about creating an environment for this. We we'll cite Mexico, we we'll cite Brazil, that has a national plan for impact investing, and some specific countries that had a fusion of inclusive business model policy that creates businesses <laughs> businesses in terms of socially different businesses and the impact investing that creates creates for purpose investment or capital for these businesses so this is at the moment not available in nigeria and you know that policy is a great driver of any market and any country that has a fit for purpose policy for a specific market you would notice that the market will grow. And you could see this maybe briefly uh, with the development of the tech space in Nigeria. Uh, the, the tech space then needed policy, then you have the Startup Act to support the space. So all these are at the moment is that are not available in Nigeria. So um, the, the investors, as much as they would not want to generate much profits they are not profit oriented but they are sustainability oriented so i could say the policy gap in nigeria at the moment is not conducive for this so we could say this is one of the major driver of um, the absence of major players in the impact space in nigeria great thank you thank you so much so this brings me on to my next question so it's very much linked to discussions we've already been having so was you um, evidence shows that DFIs are the key players in the impact investment space. So that's something that we've already just mentioned. So these institutions deployed 71% of the investment capital inflow to Nigeria between 2019 and 2021. What would you say has driven this trend and how can Nigeria attract more local private capital into the three priority sectors? Okay, thank you very much uh, once again for having me. Um, what I can say regarding the first question is the fact that the, the growth in, uh, in impact investment funds and, and the larger share of DFI is largely, largely, is largely demand driven. How do I mean? As you say, the, the business space in Nigeria is not, uh, uh, okay, like, just like Chaturina has said. Uh, when it comes to, in terms of the impact investing products or instruments, we have a, a mix of uh, equity, investment, loans, uh, debt, financing, uh, grants, and all that. Then when you look at, you know, we have a DFIs, uh, development financial institutions and non-DFIs. So when you look at DFIs, they are more positioned, or they are more skewed, they are, their interventions and capital capital deployment is more skewed to loans 
and uh, looking at the Nigerian environment in which uh, the MSMEs case uh, is being dominated by sole proprietors who are advanced to uh, equity funding just because of the fears of losing ownership in their businesses. So, 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 so they must favor loans, and I think BFIs are, are most skilled to that aspect. So, 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 so the the Nigerian businesses are, are more they, they find it more good to at least to, to access uh, funding from the BFI than the non BFI that is most skilled to equity financing and also grants. Great, fantastic. So, um, it aligns, you know, DFI. Um, kind of finance that they provide is more aligned with what um, the um, Nigerian enterprises desire. So over to Sadiq. Okay, with regards to the second question, okay, I think there are two questions in there. Okay, so okay. with regards to the second question, how can we attract private capital to the three parts sectors that Nadia said in the We are Nadia said in the report, uh, so a great health and education. So, uh, you know, all these sectors, they have their own uh, long-term and uh, structural challenges that need to be looked at. So, uh, for instance, looking at agriculture, so most interventions in agriculture are slightly been government-dominated. And when you look at it, you would find out that uh, most interventions of the government only cover the, say, the, the production aspect, while the other faces on the, uh, of the value chain and are not taking well uh, care of adequately. So, 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 so I, I, I think one thing that could be done is to ensure, like for instance, I agree, you have the production aspect, you have the post harvest segment, and you have the you have the transportation, you have the uh, processing aspect and transport and all other segments. So, so you understand. So, but if you look at issues, there are there are constraints. Okay, that needs to be addressed are across this agri value chains that would incentivize private sector investment. Say, for instance, there needs to be some good roads. Okay, there's need to, to, to open up rural communities into, into urban centers to, to be able to access the market in real time. There is need for, for certain infrastructure development in some of these rural locations that are agree in nature. So, aside from that, there is also need for proper storage facilities as to so as well as to as, as to reduce the post harvest losses that, is, that that we lose we lose huge amounts of money every year to post harvest losses just because there is bad road networks there is uh, inadequate storage facilities provided and all that so all these constraints need to be across the value chain in a great like as to, uh, have to be taken care of have to be addressed have to be resolved for private investors to be incentivized to bring in their money. Secondly, is for the is about the health. If you look at the health sector by by design, at the structure, you find out that the uh, control of the healthcare system in Nigeria is more is more government dominated. And this government, out of the health facilities we have, government accounts for two thirds. Why the private sector invest, uh, investors account for just 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 the, 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 the just uh, just the thought. Of, of the total. So how do we encourage, how do we incentivize private sector investment in the, in, 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 in the health sector? So one way to go is uh, there is this uh, this transition or this uh, uh, imagine issues of digital health. Okay, of digital health. So if we bring in digitalized, uh, digital health, or some of this, there are innovations in the health sector, in the health, digital health space. Okay, when uh, in the, uh, which which monitors maybe the stock of uh, healthcare facilities, which monitors, uh, which monitors uh, the, the data, which helps to collect data in the industry. But because of the fact that there is no technology adoption, most of, most of this, so so we need to uh, we need we need we need we need to address that issue. How do we how do we how do we encourage people to use and there is ML, there is Telemendoc, there are there are innovations coming over. But because of the fact that there's low technology adoption among the amongst Nigerians, so that will not encourage further private sector investment in that space. So there's need to address that issue. So when it comes to the education sector, 
if you look at it in terms of enrollment, data shows that enrollment falls drastically as we move from one level of education to the other. For instance, the World Bank data shows that private, private, uh, private school enrollment was at over 80% in uh, 2018, and uh, uh, secondary enrollment was was around 46%. White tertiary enrollment was was around 10%. So, 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 how do we, so how do we encourage private sector investment in a situation whereby enrollment is very low as we move up? And if you ask me, one of the reasons for this is the, the poverty level and even the high cost of education as you move up the ladder in your, in, 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 of, of, the, of education levels. So, so, so there, how do we incentivize the enrollment? That is what we need to address. To, to, to bring in private sector investment to the Thank you. Thank you very much. So sticking with unlocking um, impact investing in Nigeria, so we'll move over to Mr. Sodik. So Mr. Sodik, from a funder's point of view, what are the disincentives and factors limiting the ability of financing institutions to provide financing for businesses in Nigeria, and how can the inflow of impact investment be encouraged on the back of these challenges? Well, thank you very much for having me. I would like to take the conversation from where my colleague was stopped from. So one of the major things that is um, driving low incentive or for funders, irrespective of the category as we might have put it in this study, is that the economic environment itself is challenging. And most of the time, when the pricing of um, funding instrument is taken into consideration, the risk characteristics of the country as a whole comes into play, such that before a funding like where we have reviewed earlier, a debt instrument is the major kind of is the major form of um, funding that many of these uh, funders are are providing businesses. So, in the process of costing or pricing of that of these debt instruments, they take into consideration the risk level in the country before they then start to consider the risks, the the, the, the sector specific risks and the business specific risks before they now come to. The, the MSME that we are talking about. By the time you take all these things into consideration, you see you, 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 you see many of these funders trying to consider rate as high as 30%, 35%. Well, and when we are talking about when a business is paying, is paying interest at 30 35%, you then wonder, is it possible for this business at the end of the day to make a profit margin of 35% or 40%? So if a business is, may, is not making that margin, how does the business want to pay back? So some of these things, like what he had mentioned, is a basis for which uh, many funders are considering the economy and put um, and business in the economy. However, we can we can then start to look at some of the other pertinent things that uh, could be the issue. So we have different kind of funders when it comes to MSME and uh, this impact space. My colleagues have earlier mentioned them. We have the DFIs, we have the non-DFIs. DFIs are people that uh, institutions that are that are licensed to do financial uh, to, to to provide financial services, whether public or private. Why the non-DFIs are the ones that are not necessarily financial, and based on this, their category exposure as to how the, the the how they are being disincentivized to support businesses so i'll take it from the public uh, dfi so one of the major problems that i see is the lack of data on the financing gap in the economy you will see from the report that um let me take the agricultural sector for example we have about 182 billion dollars um financing gap and looking at previous studies on what these have been, you will discover that the government and maybe previously said they have not been able to lay emphasis on the extent of the financing that is needed. So the government over the years have been planning, have been putting in place programs and all of that to solve a problem that they don't even know the extent of the problem. So that's why at the end of the day, if you put together all government funding over the past 10 years, if you struggle to be up to 2 billion, and we have a 180 billion dollar funding gap you, know, you can see 
the extent of uh, what the government needs to do and what they have done. Also, from the part of the government, we have um, uh, we have a poor design and coverage of some of these their program. So uh, at the end of the day, they are not meeting the 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 the, the, the people that the the, the the set up the program to to achieve. And like I said, inadequate you know, the, the government and where the, the funders generally they have a problem of they don't have adequate knowledge of what many of these sectors are. Uh, the financing need of these sectors. Oftentimes, you just see a bank officer or a front desk officer trying to collect information, general information about the prospective um, prospective, prospective borrower. But many of these businesses, particularly the sectors in consideration, they have specialized need for need of funding. We have uh, in the agricultural value chain, we have different type of businesses. They have special specialized in. We have in the education sector, we have different kind of businesses that have specialized in. But what we have is a generalized um, funding that is made available by the government, different from oftentimes different from what most of these businesses need. So there's this inadequate knowledge as far as what the businesses need in terms of financing, the structure of the finance and the nature of the finance. Also, we have the issue of uh, persistent inflationary pressure in the economy. The CBN has oftentimes tried to reduce some of their supports to the to, to MSMEs due to the inflationary pressure we have in the economy and the need for the CBN to manage money supply and all of that. So that's on the government side of the DFI. Why in the private in the private um, part? On the private uh, DFI, we have um, a lot of them are being disincentivized by the fact that most of the MSMEs within this our focus sector, especially the agricultural sector, they lack adequate documentation. They don't keep proper records because of that. Most business, most most funders don't find them attractive to to finance their businesses. Lack of information on their credit worthiness, even. We are still struggling to uh, most of our credit bureaus are still struggling to get information about um, about most uh, about the the credit worthiness of uh, of people. So because of this lack of information, they don't know how to assess the potential business based on their ability to pay and all of that. Also, most of the banks that we have, even the specialized bank, the microfinance bank, development banks, at the end of the day. It, it does appear that they are only profit oriented and they don't really they just want to they just want to get um they just want to get the, the outcome oh we are able to offer social loan and we're able to make social return at the end of the day I feel that 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 profit orientation is a big problem for most msmes and particularly the sectors of our the sectors of interest education you know they need very patient credit but what we have here most of the time is just two, three years that they give you. That's when they are being considered. The high risk characteristics of MSMEs too is a big problem for them. That is a big problem that is disincentivizing funders. The crowding out effect of government borrowing over the past um, decade, we see a very high level of borrowing on the part of the government. Because of that, most banks, most financial institutions, instead of providing credit to businesses in the economy. They prefer to buy bonds, they prefer to buy treasury bills, buy OMO, and then just sit down, let their, let their, let their money sit down somewhere and be creating wealth for them. Also, we have the limited um, limitation around the kind of product that many of these banks are having, which is transcending from the, from the knowledge issue. So the product, the process, and the services that are tailored to MSMEs most of the time is not reflective of what MSMEs need. At the end of it, leading, leading to a mismatch between what MSMEs need in terms of financial products and what um, the banks are offering them. So that's on the part of um, private DFI. We also have non DFIs that uh, that are providing us with that are providing uh, philanthropic resources and all of that and all of that around. But the problem they have is. They, they struggle with transparency and accountability and corruption tendency among potential borrowers. A lot of people, a lot of these small businesses, they borrow money. When they borrow money, they take it to go and do 
one who and bear the other. And maybe when they borrow, that's when they remember, they, they want to do remembrance of their grandfather and all of that. So some of these issues is a disincentive, I mean, is a, is a discouragement for most of these funders. There's also lack of proper documentation is a problem. Even if Tony Lumelu is ready to give all the million dollars to you, if you don't have proper documentation, there's no how they can do it. Low capacity on the part of these people that are providing the fund. They don't understand what most of these businesses need. So at the end of the day, their the, the evaluation of the business need become porous and they find it difficult to, 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 to provide credit. Also, we have the politicization of many programs. At the end of so oftentimes when some of these um, non-DFI financing comes, especially as we have it with um, with um, Smedan, as we have it with um, LSETF and um, some of these um, Tony Elumeli, Billy Elumeli Foundation and the likes. People see it as a national kick. So let's, let's have our own share of the national kick and eventually they, they, they find it difficult to pay back or they refuse to pay back. So in, the, in that situation, the, the funders become wary, become very conscious before, before giving a loan to, to MSMEs. So these are among many of the issues uh, that has been a disincentivization for many disincentivization for many funders, irrespective of uh, where they are coming from. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you. So you highlighted so many issues. So there's clearly a wide range of challenges uh, which are holding back um, the flow of impact investing uh, investment into the country. And we also segmented it by DFIs and so that was quite interesting as well. Okay, so we'll go back to Mr. Wasu. So we've talked more generally about um, the impact of investing ecosystem and um, so across sectors. So now let's just look at the priority sectors that um, the report focuses, focuses on. So these critical sectors identified, which are agriculture, health, and education, have been the most hit when it comes to low access to finance in Nigeria, despite their importance to survival and human capital development. So can you speak to the barriers and impediments to accessing finance and attracting investment into these particular sectors with a focus on MSMEs and women? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, I think uh, for this, for this talk, uh, almost of uh, you see, uh, when the Nigerian MSMEs are really positioned, not just for impact investing funds, but also for general for private sector investment generally, okay, or for investment issues generally, okay, then you would, would see a considerable uh, increase in real investment in this, in this sector. But uh, to be specific. Uh, one key issue is uh, about some of these businesses is uh, one, uh, there's high level of informality. And uh, like, well, how do I mean? The number of businesses are not registered. And, uh, you know, to access most of these funds and all that, you, 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 there's need for documentation, at least your KPI should be convincing enough so, so that they can the funders can take a look at your KPIs to, de to determine your credit worthiness. But uh, in the first place, when you are not registered, your KPIs are not available, making it difficult to know your credit worthiness, then you get no funding. That's number one. That needs to be added. Two is uh, the, the huge literacy, the, the, the high, high rate of literacy uh, and skills gap, huge skills gap. Um, when, when it comes to skills gap, okay, you will find out that uh, most people, uh, they, they resort to a particular sector just because they, there are no other opportunities for them. And, uh, and let me just take the instance of the education sector. You see, uh, 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 a number of graduates, in fact, engineers that were trained to the engineers, that were trained to the, uh, to the, to, to the to be uh, lawyers and all that, they ended up taking up uh, the jobs, many are jobs in the education sector, just because they don't have such uh, such opportunities. And, and, and even aside that, 
uh, when it comes to uh, the transport sector, you see a lot of graduates, just like a ranch peg in, in, in a square hole or a square hole in a ramp peg, whatever, any, any of these two. So, 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 the, so, 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 so in, in that particular industry, for you to act, to, to convince your funders that you, that that they uh, aside from the fact that they are going to get some returns, financial returns, that they, they, they it's going to also translate to some level of social impact, okay, that they would like to see. So, they, so then at least the, the skill set has to has to be fantastic. The skill set has to be huge enough, and I think. That's the that's where the non DFIs, uh, particularly the, the, the those that give grants. For instance, they told me a Lumelu fund uh, entrepreneurship uh, program foundation that has this uh, third program almost year in year out. So such a program targets uh, 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 like the, the, in terms of the package of the program, you are trained, you get trained, and afterwards successful. Uh, graduates, just a handful of them get uh, financing, get funding to establish themselves. She understand. So, 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 but, 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 not on DFI, not all impact investing funds, but primarily on the DFI side, that's most, mostly dominant. Okay, is is ready to train you in the skills in the areas of interest. So, 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 so that that's one issue we also need to look at. Critically. The third is the uh, uh, poor managerial skills. Okay, also talking to skill set. The next one is uh, just like Sodika has used to is um, the the high rate of business retail risks in Nigeria. If you ask me, the just a handful of MSM is about five percent half an active insurance policy. So, so, so the question will not be when such business faces some kind of risks, okay, that would require some compensation from insurance and all that. And because of that, they are not insured, then that means, that means the invest, the only investment is lost. So, investors, funders are also looking out for they will only choose business that, that are highly and adequately insured, insured, or have active insurance policies. Another issue is. The fact that you want to get funds, but it's like uh, you are going to the farm without a cutlass and all. Okay, yes, you get to the farm, and without cutlass and all, you do not. So most people don't have business plans. So, so if you don't have business plans to consolidate upon what you have, or even to start a business as being a seed business and all that, then. How do you get proper funding? Most of these businesses do not have clear cuts and even uh, a business plan to show for what they are doing as a business. So funders are looking out for, and you know, funders will always, always be looking for, for for businessmen, business people that that are, that, that has a, a, a viable business that have viable business plans and all that that that, that could be positioned for proper funding. So with no business plan, you get no funding. So these are some of these these issues that needs to be addressed. These are some of the barriers, key barriers that needs to be to be resolved, and then that the yeah that needs to be resolved and ameliorated for for Nigerian businesses to to be well positioned for private uh, investors for, for, for private capital, uh, inclusive of uh, uh, impact investing funding. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Yes. So we've touched on a lot of the challenges that exist within you know, the Nigerian market. And uh, it's been both on the demand side and also on the supply side. So it's been quite encompassing. So Sadiq, we're going to come back to you. So let's try to determine some of the ways we can address these barriers. So the question is, you know, so how can we identify critical sectors, position to leverage, and also to make them attractive to the impact investment space so that we can plug you know, the funding gaps that have been um, already explained by the two of you, especially for small businesses and women. So what are the ways we can address barriers and impediments? And just give a few. Okay, thank you once again. 
so he, he he's quite um he's quite um i don't know how to qualify that but it's just unfortunate that the sector we are considering they happen to be the most hit by many of this conversation they are the bottom of it all of the issues hit them the most 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 of the other sectors businesses are ready to i mean funders are ready to to just dump um, their resources on them given the fact that most of the people playing in those spaces they are they they they, they are a bit educated and if you are according to what was you said that um, a lot of people they engage in some of these businesses especially in the agricultural sector because they have no alternative so you just just dump yourself there because you don't have uh, another means of uh, livelihood so with that you can do something so as it is uh, many of these sectors that these sectors that we are considering they have specialized financial need like i said earlier but one thing is one thing is very very common among them they all need patient capital and um it's important that our the funders irrespective of where they are coming from even the the people coming with the heavy impact capital they need to take their time to understand what they need especially given the the nature of our economy many of these issues might not be issue for advanced countries but in developing countries like us these funders dfis non dfis we know the onus is on the non dfis the most but dfis too in the interest of social corporate responsibility i mean corporate social responsibility they need to take their time to to understand the financial need and the characteristics of the funding the, these businesses need but on the business side there is need for heavy capacity development right? there are lots of things to say has mentioned many of them businesses these businesses need to know how to develop business business plan it is when the fund that is able to read your business plan or your is it mot or mor that they call it that it will be able to understand what you need money for and how you want to use the money and understand how they are going to design it, the financial product for you but when you don't even have a business plan you don't, it shows that you yourself you don't understand the business then you want the financial the financial institutions to come and understand the business it's not possible it's going to be a, it's, it's going to be a waste of time so once they, they need to develop capacity in that area you develop capacity in financial management bookkeeping branding and packaging of your product insurance like what you mentioned and some industry specific developmental training they need to develop capacity around some of these things also after uh, beyond capacity there is need for awareness management for MSMEs and youth and women businesses concerning the availability of um, funding we have there are so many of them here and there if you read some of these um, fit foundation report on access to finance and um, state of entrepreneurship in nigeria many there are many businesses don't even know what is out they don't even know the resources available to them there are many there are many of these things here and there the governments many of these bank stanley sterling bank is doing a, a lot of things for both agriculture education and health access bank is doing a lot many of these banks are doing so many things to us to assist businesses but there is, a, there is an information gap between the businesses and the the funders so there is need for for us to, to to do some kind of awareness management such that opportunities that businesses can explore to access fund is made available to them in the very last mile wherever they are and this is a call on uh, the civil society organizations to come together to well it might not be easy to come together as a civil society organization but at least endeavor to make sure that this information is getting to as much businesses as possible for them to be able to take advantage of many of these uh, resources that are being made available and concerning the women there is a there is need for deliberate effort to 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 categorize them as as a major point of um, support such that any funding opportunity or any program of it that is being developed women constitution should be put in, into it it's not no 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 not much can be done when we when many of these programs are being developed 
by saying, oh, this program should only focus on women. But there is need for deliberate effort to give to give a um, serious preference to, to to women businesses because they, they play a lot of role in the stability of our society. So thank you. Great, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it's been a very interesting interview. We've learned a lot about the um, ecosystem for impact investing in Nigeria. So thank you to the team and thank you to the listeners for your time. Be sure to look out for the full report, Investing for Impact in Nigeria, Deep Dive into Agriculture, Education and Health Sectors, which has gender and sustainability as cross-cutting themes. This report is out later this year. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having us on this um, your podcast. Thank you for being a part of today's interesting program. You can learn more about the NESG's If Not Now When campaign at www.ifnotnowwhen.ng. You can also listen to other interesting conversations by visiting www.nesggroup.org forward slash podcasts.